Hello again, friends, and welcome to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through, right here, wherever it is that you've downloaded this show from, or perhaps you're streaming it. You never really know. We don't get a breakdown that's very accurate in terms of what is what. But we are here. You are babbling. Well, potentially. Continue. Uh, Jim Cornette will be answering your questions, which are sent in a number of ways to corny drive through at gmail.com or on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through. I'm your host, the great Brian Last. And with that, good morning. Let's go to Jim Cornette. Oh, God, that was unwieldy. And what, <laughs> and what, what happened to, and, and you are our friends. What happened to that? Because you, you need to bring the cult of Cornette listeners of the program here into our, our bosoms, our wombs, as it were, and, 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 and bundle and cuddle them and call them George and, 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 uh, bring them in. But that's how George got his name. George, the rat, the much maligned and, and George, the rat, <laughs> who's, whose memory has been besmirched by the artful Dodger, but George, the rat got, cause he was so cute. We said, we will love him and squeeze him and call him George. From the cartoon, you 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 are disappointing me in a number of ways. I'm sure you've heard that before. It's funny, the your... more you talk, I'm thinking, which way did he go, George? Is actually okay, well. Oh, for heaven's sake, that's not well. We wouldn't need to name somebody. Which way did he go? It see, it just doesn't make any sense. Your pop culture knowledge is disappointing me on a number of levels here lately. But at least bring them in, friends, and you are our fr- friends. Every time I hear that, friends, I think about Boyd Pierce. I love, but what a nice old man. You know, it's a shame if anybody knows who Boyd Pierce is these days at all anymore, they probably are making fun of him because of his clothes because they don't get the gimmick. But Boyd in the locker room, Mid-South TV in Shreveport, he used to do, he had this great old radio announcer's voice. He still sounded, you know, just Texas country, but it it had mellifluous tones like one of those old radio announcer's friends. Do you poop out at parties? Do you stoop and strain? <laughs> Try a bottle of Dr. Proctor's Red Rectum Rockers. They're good. And it just, he was always telling jokes. Or crap. Boyd Pierce, for the uninitiated, was the ring announcer on Mid-South Wrestling Television that wore the wild, outlandish, uh, brightly colored suits. And the old and and the one who would sometimes introduce Bill Watts, uh, he he basically that's what Boyd was in later years. And and now people watching on a network are like, who's this fucking guy, right? But Boyd was a big deal in, in Texas wrestling all over the state, going back to at least the fifties, probably the forties. And he, uh, the way I understood it, in the eighties when I first met him down there, he had money. He wasn't you know, doing this for a job or anything. He did it because he loved the business and he'd been around it for 40 years. And he had done programs, written for the programs. He had done television at one point all over the state of Texas for the different offices and had done uh, Watts' Mid-South TV in the early days because he was a a noted name uh, announcer at that time in that part of the country. And he had evolved that gim, and all the fans just loved him. He was the local, you know, uncle, grandpa, whatever. But he had those wild colored suits, and because he just had them made, I guess, at the whim. So I know he had some money, but some of them looked like couch covers, and others ones looked like you know your grandmother's drapes, and others were. I remember when I first got there. I'd heard of Boyd and I knew, you know, from the announcer, but I did see it in person. I'm like, fuck my gimmick is I'm supposed to have these fucking obnoxious suits. And I look like a banker next to Boyd, but he would even, if he had like a red jacket and blue pants and red shoes, he'd have blue socks. He'd raise up his pant legs. You could see his blue socks and he'd open up his jacket and he'd have red and blue pins inside the jacket pocket. The pins to match the suit. He was a what a fucking gimmick. Yeah. Back when guys were were gimmicks instead of you know were given gimmicks. But plus he made a ton of money selling gimmicks. All those wrestling king of sports. Yes. Came from him, right? The keychains, yeah. everything. He did a lot of the gimmicks. He, like I said, he'd done a lot of the programs. He had done announcing of various program or various shows for years. Not just ring announcing, but I mean the you know television announcing. And you know I I don't even know this, but. 
at the time, of course, Watts started Mid South. Uh, Boyd was a you know legendary announcer. I think he may have done work for Leroy McGurk. So and then later on, as Watts decided he wanted to really expand, and and Boyd was very regional in his appeal, and he was getting older, and Watts also had that itch where he wanted to fucking. He wanted to tell his own stories, right? He's the booker, but he's going to hammer this shit over on commentary. So it became, uh, Boyd would basically say, hello again, everybody, and welcome to Mid-South Wrestling. And here's the Oklahoma Stampeder himself, the president of Mid-South Sports, Cowboy Bill Watts. And the next words Boyd would say in that one-hour program was, well, that's it. We'll see you next week, folks, on Mid-South Wrestling. (laughs) He was just there because the people still loved him so much. He was the link to, they didn't want to upset the apple cart too much. And then finally it became every two weeks he'd rotate with Jr. And then it was Jr. and Watts pretty much. But um, no, no, no. They had two teams. It was Boyd and Bill Watts. They kept, well, the that's right. Boyd, Boyd and then it was Watts, J- uh, Jim Ross and Joel Watts. Was yes, the that's right. And yeah. oh my God. And Joel was, but anyway, but Boyd, <laughs> but Boyd could call a pretty good fucking old fashioned Southern wrestling match in that accent too he was a yeah a old-fashioned announcer he was really cool and smooth and everything but anyway um the what was i what was i gonna goddamn say um you can't oh, you, you can't move on before we talk reese or bowden now well no well hold on a say no I was, I was gonna say something else about boyd and you distracted before we talk about the living corpse <laughs> reese or bowden who was the exact opposite instead of an over-the-top personality had no personality i on one of the local promos, I actually did this. I had a pocket mirror, and I went up to Reeser Bowden and held a mirror up in front of his mouth. I just, I just wanted to check and see if you're still with us, Reeser. <laughs> you know, but he was the station announcer and a, a, a Channel 3 guy there in Shreveport when they did the TV there, and then they still did it in Shreveport when they moved the Irish McNeil. They did the promos there also, so that's how he was. A, but my, he didn't want to be the over-the-top wrestling announcer to lend his – gravitas to anything but at the same time he couldn't say anything sideways or watts would have bitch slapped him so he would just totally just deadpan it was just it was brutal <laughs> uh but no a boy oh boyd what i was gonna say with boyd was he was a an obsessive collector also because i have some old texas programs that uh that he's featured in and he even had a wrestling match that um uh, or that were from his collection, actually, that a, a guy in North Carolina uh, passed on to me that had befriended him, and he had sent him some. But he had a huge collection of stuff at one time. I don't know whatever happened to all of it. But um, but anyway, he'd been figured in. And what I was going to say was he was living in a suburb of Dallas when he was working for Watts, and he'd be in the Superdome. He wouldn't miss Superdome. And he'd be uh, it, sometimes in Oklahoma, and he'd do the TV down in Shreveport. But he never, when we went to world class, he never even appeared, showed up, walked in the door, said hello to anybody at a Dallas area or a world class wrestling event, even though he lived there. He hated Fritz, and, right? Well, that's what I would love to know what the, what started that, because that had to go back probably 20 years. <clears throat> but I even I even drove him one time over to Shreveport to TV and back when I'd moved to Dallas they booked me back over to manage the Guerreros against to rock and roll on uh, Shreveport TV and Boyd called me and said well I know you're going to be going over there now that you're over this way I said I'd be glad to take you boy and I picked him up at his hand Burleson Texas and took him over and back and he was just fucking hilarious just cool old guy but anyway friends and you are our friends try a bottle of dr proctor's red rectum rocker you know what they're gonna need red rectum rockers for after i'm finished with them is the big have a beef with jim Cornette celebration in chicago in march at c2e2 the feedback is incredible hopefully the throw-ups will not be as vehement as the (laughs) the feedback has been now we're gonna have quality classic italian chicago italian beef sandwiches as part of this but at c2e2 Uh, March 22nd through the 24th at McCormick Place in Chicago. It is the Midwest's annual biggest pop culture extravaganza of all time. Uh, And I will have a booth, uh, the Cornette's Collectibles booth, all three days, signing autographs, taking photo ops, uh, kissing babies, petting puppies, and the like. But Saturday night, March the 23rd, obviously, is part of the C2E2 After Dark. Because I look better, apparently, in pitch blackness. Um... We will have an all-VIP gathering of the Cult of Cornette. Have a beef with Jim Cornette, the JC Experience, live in Chicago. 
three hours or more, as as we've said, this, there's no union cutoff here. We're going to I'm going to stay as long as it takes. I'm going to be the Springsteen of live events here. It's going to be the stand-up meltdown. It's going to be the interactive Q&A, Chicago stories from the NWA and the WWF, a free signed 8 by 10 a free photo op, personal time hangout bullshit, and a Chicago Italian beef sandwich. Have a beef with me in Chicago, and everybody is a VIP, 65 bucks a head across the board. No, in, uh, We encourage your attendance at C2E2, but no uh, C2E2 uh, tickets are required. It's a separate ticket event. They will need a sandblaster, as they're saying in Chicagoland, to wipe the smile off your fucking faces after you have a beef with me. And tickets are going fast, so do not be left out of either the beef or the smile or me on your fucking face or whatever. I don't know. I didn't think the last go-home line through there. You know, Jim, I don't know if you know this, but the reason Boyd stopped doing the spots for the Red Rocket, Red Rocket Rectum Rockets or whatever the fuck they are was because there was a fear of lawsuits, that there could be a giant lawsuit with oh, people just having their rectums <laughs> popped all over the place with these just Red Rockets. Rectums. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you something. If you've had somebody that's rocked your rectum and you want to wreck them in return, <laughs> then I got a referral for you. None other than the law offices of Stephen P. New. That is newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. That is the number to call. That is the website to visit. That is the man to contact. And whether it's your rectum that's been rocked or any other part of your body or your family or your possessions or your friends, you can refer people as we have been doing. If they have, if you know someone in your social circle that has had a problem with some Big company or corporation, BP, Exxon, Ford, Big Pharma, Amazon, Universal, General Motors, all those fucking assholes that just step all over you and wiped their callous feet along the side of your face like you're Tony Atlas or somebody. Well, Stephen P. New has gotten millions in judgments against big companies that fuck people over, and he's the champion of the little guy, and he's the champion of the cult of Cornette. If I have a legal problem, and the occasion has transpired in the past where I have, I look no further than Stephen P. New. Do not overlook Stephen P. New. And as a matter of fact, Stephen's going to be in at um, Madison, West Virginia on April 13th as part of the big... All-Star Wrestling, Midnight Express 35th Anniversary Tour Stop, Smoky Mountain Wrestling Legends Match. Stephen P. New and I are going to be there to uh, to try to find somebody to sue. It's going to be incredible. So we encourage everybody to come down. <laughs> Stephen's going to bring, I think. <laughs> what a selling three. point. You can come and we, you potentially could be the one we sue. Yes. Yeah. And he's going to bring three or four eight by tens also if anybody wants his autograph. Three or four. Three or four. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, uh, now that we're done besmirching our sponsors, let's move on with the program here. And our first question, Jim, was... Oh, we sim- still, still got to do a show now, don't we? We do. Unless you want to talk more Reese Bowden. I could do that all day. Oh, but uh, it, you've said, well, of course, everybody, he's probably most famous. I guess they've seen the clip. It was from the interviews that we used to do at Channel 3 in Shreveport every every Wednesday. Uh, where Scott Irwin, the super destroyer was going off about something and went and, and kicked the podium in frustration and caught his foot also in Reese's stool that he would sit in and be all relaxed behind the desk there as he read his, his notes and fucking Reese just went, just dropped out of sight backwards over hit ass over tea kettle. Like he'd be fallen down an elevator shaft <laughs> that made America's funniest home videos. And he still never, I don't think screamed. He's become very popular on the Mid-South Wrestling Television Review Show I do with Mike Mills because there's a lot of things I never picked up on the first time I watch it. But watching it now, knowing he had to have been driving Bill Watts crazy and knowing that he just had his own pace yeah, and he was going to go his own pace no matter what <laughs> was happening around him, there are moments we're now convinced that he was not smartened up at all. He was never told anything that was going to happen because there's even times where like an angle takes place and he's talking on the mic like he's the narrator of the show. And Boyd is trying to talk over him yeah. to the people at home because he's just like, well, now we don't know what's going to happen. 
Well, where, yeah, no. What's going to happen now? <laughs> he just starts. I would almost get. I mean, he obviously picked some things up on his own as a grown adult when he was seeing, you know, being around the guys. But I'm pretty sure they gave him as little pre knowledge as possible of what was happening. And you were there when he left. You were there for the end of Reeser. Well, yeah, well, I never actually. All of a sudden, we just turned around one day and he was gone. I don't really know what happened. It may have been when you started grabbing that microphone from him so you could do the introductions. Well, I I would like to take some credit for it, but I don't think I had anything to do with it. Every once in a while, he didn't want to let it go at first. He before he got used <laughs> to my deal, he said, like, "What are you doing? I mean, give me the gimmick." You know, I had that a lot. I had tug of wars with ring announcers in cities all over the country, all the way through the Crockett days. Because <laughs> it, no, seriously, there was a few that Tom Miller one time in in uh, Greensboro. He didn't want to give it up. And, he's and a I had a big guy. He's a yeah, big he was guy. a he was a big well, he was a big older guy and he wasn't gonna fight over it, but he was like holding on to it. And I was like, give me the gimmick I'm supposed to do, you <laughs> dumb shit, because he didn't know. Um and then there was sometimes it would be some local announcer that didn't necessarily want, you know, want me to have the microphone. And they always lost, but sometimes it was a bit of a struggle. I was like that goddamn timekeeper in Charleston, South Carolina. Now I, now I sound like I'm in front of the fire somewhere in a, in a cabin. <laughs> and Charleston, Charleston is one of our better. But the the uh, honest to God, the I think he was with the local VFW group. The timekeeper let the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express go an hour and three or four minutes of a 60-minute time limit match because – he was so convinced in Ricky's comeback that they were about, or Robert's comeback and Rock and Roll's comeback, that they were about to win the belts, that he didn't want to ring the bell and rob them of the opportunity. And when we realized that, we had to do a DQ. So we did the only ever hour and three minute fucking 60 minute world tag team title match. All right. Well, let's get some questions in well, here. Well, I thought you'd be entertained by some piece of wrestling history like that, some footnote that's been uncovered. I remember that story. You uncovered it several times in the past. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll uncover something and show it to you here in a minute. <laughs> you like. All right, well, let's get a question here. This one was sent in to Cordy Drive through at gmail.com from Ron G in Atlanta, Georgia. Jim, I've heard you speak about CM Punk before but I'm not sure if you've stated what you thought about him as a pro wrestler. How do you feel his in-ring work and promos hold up against some of the all-time greats? If you've heard it, what are your thoughts on his infamous pipe bomb promo? <laughs> Side note, your brother Midnight imitation is fucking hysterical. P.S. Fuck you, Joey Ryan. Tally ho and thank you, fuck you, bye. Ron G in Atlanta. Um, <sighs> CM Punk was an acquired taste in the ring for me. And I think it was as he acquired more in ring when he was, to be honest, when he was the darling of the independence, I just, I didn't see a top guy. I thought he was, you know, was a little, just, he was doing moves, but he wasn't, you know what I'm saying? Help me try to, he was portraying a wrestler, but not being a wrestler. And I didn't care for the fucking promos that that I happened to see of his in in early times before anybody established what was going on. But as he got over, you could not deny that he was over. So I gave it a second look to figure out what the fuck. And that was a different guy than I'd seen in the Independence or Ring of Honor or whatever, not only verbally, but the intensity in his eyes. He just grew up late, in my opinion. He blossomed late for what I look for in a, in a guy wrestling and, and to, to this day still, I like his verbal ability better than I, it, I don't want to say it that way. It sounds like I'm knocking him. I'm a more fan of his promo, especially at pipe bomb promo. I did see that. And that was a fucking performance. I'm more fan of his verbal than I am of his in ring, but uh, you know, but you can't deny he was fucking incredibly over and they, and they gave him a contract. They had to give him just to get him back just so they could fucking fuck him up. So he wouldn't be as over. Cause they knew he didn't want to be there and, and whether it was, you know, you bringing him back and showing that quickly and showing that he was under their thumb. And I, I think Nash power bombed him and whatever the fuck, but he, once again, one of the great exit lines ever in, in uh, close to an exit line in this case, ever in wrestling was when he told triple H, I don't need to work with you. You need to work with me. 
<laughs> that was that was right up there with Adam Pierce uh, sending an email to Carrie Silkin saying, first of all, fuck Sid and Ross. That was a m- memorable exit line. <laughs> you know, so I'm, but yeah, they did. I, he, most times you don't get a guy that fucking hot, that strong. And, and they did not take advantage of it. And, but he at least got to last laugh because he saved his money and got to go home. And I, I presume even with this fucking lawsuit that he still got some money. And, and so hopefully he, you know, it, He's still a young man, but I'm pretty sure he could probably do something else than uh, than go back if he doesn't want to go back. So that will be that'll be one of those. Maybe it'll be that Jack Briscoe retirement that we never hear about anymore, where he just said, "Gerald, <laughs> I'm going back in that airport. And I'm getting on the first thing headed south." That's always been a great uh, uh, exit line for me, also. I like Terry Funk's better where he just left Vince a note that said, I have to go. My horses. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta go <laughs> and take care of my sick horse taped to Vince's hotel room door. The weekend of survivor series. Well, he, he, it, it either, he f- found out some information that had been revealed to him or elsewise. It may have just dawned on him. I don't know that he was fixed to be on a fucking, job guy fucking team it was going to get fucking beat to pieces on live pay-per-view for no apparent reason yeah i think the team ended up being and i could be wrong a masked jeff gaylord a masked greg valentine and i forget who the third person was but obviously terry funk was in that mix yeah somewhere for whatever reason i was it was never re- revealed to me our next question jim was sent in to corny drive through at gmail.com from paul thomas in coventry england Uh, Hello there, Brian and Jim. We hear a lot about Jim's thoughts on classic and modern wrestlers, but less so about those from the turn of the millennium. So my question is, did Jim ever work with Nigel McGuinness, and what are his thoughts on him? (laughs) Is he a classic example of unrealized potential? Oh, my God. I I worked with Nigel several times. Uh, Nigel was our uh color commentator for ring of honor when we first went on sinclair but i had known nigel since back when he was working with les thatcher in cincinnati in the hwa and i gotta be honest Le- less uh nigel was a bit of a late bloomer also because when when he worked for less he was a, a great kid nice kid he's always been a nice person and he just it, it physically and he didn't have his shit yet or shit down yet and i thought well you know he tries hard it works hard and he's he's going to be okay and then when i saw him in ring of honor of what would that have been almost 10 years later say seven eight years later holy shit all of a sudden i mean to his unfortunate uh damage he was throwing those clotheslines and fuck and he had uh, come up with a bunch of new shit and changed his style around in the ring. It was very serious and it was stiff and hard hitting. And once again, the head butts and shit stuff that he shouldn't have been doing, but, um, but he was doing a lot of stuff he should have been doing. And he had just transformed himself. I, you know, I was like, holy shit. And then obviously he got the chance to go to WWF. They did the documentary here recently on him. And, and I, I think that's called attention more to the one that he did on himself a while back, but uh, right as he gets his big chance, they won't sign him because of the fucking medical issues, the shoulder, and blah, blah, blah. And But when all, you know, when it was thought, that, and even TNA even, it, it had he, he got over instantly with his work, and then they fucking shoveled him with the booking when Hogan came in. So he was... he. Every time he'd get a chance anywhere, it was like he was cursed uh, to the point where a lot of people don't know this, but obviously our first choice for color commentator in Ring of Honor for the Sinclair television was Adam Pierce. Not that we had anything. Nigel hadn't really been considered for the position because he was under contract to TNA. But when Ross Abrams, the merchandise weasel, because he hated Adam Pierce because Adam told him what he'd thought of him three years ago, put himself in ahead of the company and the new owners and all the talent and everybody and whined to corporate that he didn't want to work with Adam Pierce. Instead of firing the fucking idiot that sold the t-shirts, they basically said, no, we can't bring Adam Pierce in. Oh, 
the fuck? So we had to find a color commentator. That's what Nigel knew the product. Nigel was uh, unhappy in TNA and was trying to get his release, get all sorted out with the legalities of that down there. And it came down to like 13 days before our first taping until Nigel got his release so that we could put him on our television. But and, and, and Kevin Kelly worked with him. He knew the product. He just hadn't done a lot of broadcasting. But I think those few years there where he teamed with Kevin and got a chance to to do a variety of, of uh, announcing and learn the production side, I think helped him tremendously. And now he's, uh, from what I understand, doing tremendous work in the same spot, but for the big boys. You know, that's one role that CM Punk was actually really good in. When he got injured at one point and he was under contract, they made him a commentator on Raw, and I thought he was excellent in that role. Yeah, and you know, see, that's the only problem there with, well, not saying that he'd want to be an, uh, a commentator and announcer now, but if you if he was good at that role, but he's such a big star, you couldn't have brought Steve Austin in and made him the host of a show after his career. It wouldn't have, I, you, that type of level guy overshadows the product. Lawler was huge, but in a completely different universe and in a you know previous time, et cetera, any transition. Um, but you know, it, it, it a lot with with Nigel, with Adam Pierce, who I thought would have done tremendous. Also, what I was going to recreate was the professional announcer, play by play guy, and the retired jock wrestler color guy that still brings a new perspective. Joe Rogan looks like the retired jock. Even he was just a fucking fanatical nerd and works out, you know, and a nerd over UFC stuff. But, but that kind of network broadcasting pairing always, and and to have the color guy be a straight straight guy also, not a heel, because that's more sports oriented. That's what I think. Uh, Nigel fit that perfectly. Once also that people were able to. He's he. As first his his accent was a bit tough especially depending regionally in what part of the uh, United States you were in. But, but he really, he started adding so much to the show. Our next question, Jim was sent in on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through from old school wrestling. After the Ronnie Garvin fireball, you took a bit of a time off. How well do you think the angle played out in your absence? Condry's cosmic fireball is one of my all time favorite <laughs> promos. Yes, it, well, I, I actually had, wait a minute, what was it? Um, 14, I had 12 days off uh, because, and of course, Dusty did not consult with me ahead of time on this. So I realize now that, you know, he he just booked it because that's what, you know, because he was a genius. But that's, I I just got married for the very first time. So it was special. And I had arranged to take 12 days off for a honeymoon and go to Hawaii, right? So it was, and it was Valentine's day that, uh, that weekend. So I can't, I think it was the 13th or 14th and we, then we were going right out. Uh, uh, but whatever the date was in Charlotte, we get there that night and they're doing TV in the Charlotte Coliseum. They've got the Nemo truck there and everything. It's a syndicated TV. And, you know, Dusty had some angles he was doing in the other matches. And he said, okay, he said, boom. He had told me, bring the fire. You're going to throw some fire. I'd got that much of a heads up a couple of days beforehand. And then when he laid the thing out, I'm like, holy shit, this is going to be fucking hot. Because I get in, hit Garvin in the face with the fucking fireball. <clears throat> Which not only, you know, incinerates him, but, you know, I've saved the U.S. tag title for the Midnight Express. We had a good house there that night. But then here comes Jimmy Garvin. This is the big angle. It's going to turn Jimmy babyface for the next fucking year or whatever. And, you know, everybody knew they were brothers, but they didn't make a big deal out of it because they were on opposite sides. But now this has been so heinous that I've done this to Ronnie Garvin that Jimmy, even though he's a heel and has been associated with us in the past and comes from the same locker room. He's going to fucking get mad at me and attack me and blah, blah, blah. And that's and bust- great. The way he charges through and yeah. gets you is amazing. Well, and see, that was legitimate back in the Charlotte Coliseum. In the back, there was a big open area that you could drive a vehicle up in as kind of a concrete ramp. Or And then the heel locker room was on the right side of that. And the babyface locker room was on the left-hand side. And if you went out in that area, which was closed to the public and it was pitch black, if you needed to talk to one of your opponents, you could. But it wasn't, you know, 
it, it wasn't just a mingle area. So when when they follow the camera follows Jimmy, who's bundling Ronnie and his burnt face down the aisle and the people are screaming, we've already left. The cops are taking us out and people are throwing shit. Jimmy settles him down there in the baby face locker room to make sure that everything's okay. And then you see him look over like, cause he knows where to go because he's just left there. He's been in the heels. He fucking runs. He, he opens the door and runs across that open area in the dark and then boots the fucking heel locker room open. And, and the Charlotte Coliseum back in the, it was like fucking that plasterboard doors and shit. Right. And that thing flies open and I know he's coming, but he came like a goddamn cannonball. Cause he had told me, he said, I'm going to come. I said, I'm going to cover up. So do what you need to do. Right. And as soon as I saw him coming, I throw my hands up over my fucking head and come off that chair underneath him and curled up in a fucking fetal position. And he's wailing on me and all the fucking heels are trying to grab him. And the baby faces have run in trying to grab fucking, I don't know what the fuck. Cause I'm covered up in a fetal position. Right. I don't know what was happening. There was a lot of screaming. And then he, of course, grabs Ronnie and he and Precious take him to the hospital. So that was the last night that I was there. And I, this was before the internet. I was not about to fucking call from Hawaii on my honeymoon to see how things were doing, right? So I get back. It was the day before the, uh, uh, the bunkhouse stampede final in Pittsburgh that set the record with uh, Dusty and Bubba. But I think I came back into Minneapolis or whatever and got to see the fucking TBS show in the hotel room before we went to the show that night. And that's the first time I saw the tape where, oh my God, Ronnie's fucking face went up in fucking flames and the fireball had stuck to him. Cause I knew, cause I'd called him afterwards that night, like Ronnie, I'm saying, he said, no, I told you to make it look good. You know, but it stuck to his fucking face. It burned his eyebrows off and his nose hair and fucking took the first layer of skin off his cheeks and, but anyway, I saw what it looked like, and then <clears throat> we got to t- we got to TBS. Did we do TBS? I don't know. But when I got back to TBS to do a, a show again and got the hate mail, some that I still have framed on my office wall here. You know, how dare you said you will be consigned to the flames of hell for setting that man on on fire? It just it was insane. We had a ton of heat over that, and then oh no, when I went back to TBS was when also Dusty told me, yeah. Kid, we're going to book you against Gavin. Oh, that's great. In the in cage. What? <laughs> One-on-one? We did that like three or four times. Charlotte, Norfolk. Charlotte did 70 grand for Jim Cornette versus Ronnie Garvin in a cage when tickets were $10 and $12. How'd those but, matches uh, go? Um, no, he was fantastic. It was fucking easy. And you, and let me give you... And nobody, once again, there were like, there's 7,000 people in the Charlotte Coliseum. And this was not a real strong undercard either, to be quite honest with you. And not a soul left pissed off or griping about the work rate. Ronnie Garvin goes out in a fucking cage. They play the Midnight Express music. Here I come in a fucking neck brace and an arm sling with the midnight behind me with a note from my doctor that I've just, I've slipped and hurt myself in training and I, there's no way I can compete tonight and offering the, Ronnie Garvin the opportunity to pick either one of the midnight express to be his, their, his opponent instead. I think the rock and roll and the rock and roll express come out from behind fucking nail Bobby, nail Dennis, grab me and throw me in a fucking cage and the door slams. Cause now we've already killed five or six fucking minutes, right? Maybe longer. And this door slams behind me and I get up and fucking see Garvin and I immediately throw the fucking sling over my head. Right. <laughs> like, Oh fuck. Cause I need both arms and I'm begging him <laughs> and he's fucking, I'm going to fucking kill you. And I start climbing the goddamn cage. And while the rock and roll express is fending the midnight off from the door outside, I climb up past the top rope on the fucking cage. Like I'm going to get out and Garvin reaches up and grabs the back pockets of my fucking suit pants and fucking rips my goddamn pants to shreds right off of me, right? I've still got the belt and some shit hanging right now. I'm in my shirt and my fucking tie and a neck brace. And I take the bump and he takes the fucking neck brace off of me and lets everybody see it and then wraps it back around my fucking neck and starts throttling me. And my arms and legs are fucking flying everywhere because he's choking me to fucking death and the people are screaming. And then he throws that aside. And then he starts, I think he takes my tie, right? (laughs) 
and he does something with the fucking tie around my neck or whatever. And I'm trying to get, I go for the door and he fucking grabs me and he pulls me back in. He's never struck me yet. Right. He may have somehow given me, he throws me back in. I take a big bump across the goddamn ring <clears throat> and the referee's telling him, stop, stop. You're going to kill the man. And I go in my fucking what's left of my pants pocket or my shorts or somewhere and get the powder and throw the powder in his eyes. Right. And now he's blind staggering around. Now the goddamn rock and roll express is on one side of the ring, screaming at the people, go Ronnie, go. And they're behind him. And on the other side, the midnight's going, kill him, Jimmy. And I pull out the fucking nucks. I slip the nucks on and I punch him right in the fucking head. And I got a pretty good punch. It didn't look too bad. Garvin goes down and gets color. So now I'm standing there with the fucking brass knucks with my pants ripped off in shreds, a fucking shirt that is, the tail is out because it's got nowhere to go. And Ronnie Garvin's got powder all over him. He's down and I've got the knucks. And I hit him a couple more times with the fucking knucks before the referee can see him and take him away. And now Ronnie Garvin is bleeding and selling. Ha 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 ha. And I goddamn put the boots to him as he's trying to come up in the corner. I put the boots to him. I rake his eyes. He goes down. I hit the ropes. I come off with a big elbow drop. Of course he moves. I splatter myself. The people fucking roar again. Now he pulls himself up to his feet by the ropes in the corner and looks over at me with the goddamn powder and the blood streaming down his face. And I fucking put the brakes on and my knees quiver and I put my hands out. No, please. And he fucking goddamn comes over and grabs a hold of me. And I think that's where he picked me up and gave me a fucking slam. He wasn't going to hit me with his knockout punch. He's got to do some shit, right? He picks me up. He gives me a fucking slam. He gets over the top of me. You've never seen a more terrifying visage. Then Ronnie Garvin working pissed off with blood and powder all over his face, <laughs> throwing punches down at you. He fucking grabs me and he hits me once. He hits me twice. He hits me three times. Can't feel a fucking thing. Look like he's killing me. And then he fucking grabs me in a double handed choke around my neck. Like he's going to fucking finish me off and do what he's promised to the people. But since he's choking me there, I'm flat on the mat and the referee goes down and before Ronnie realizes it counts one, two, three. Ding, ding, ding. The match is over. Now the door can be opened. When the door is opened, here comes the fucking rock and roll and the midnight pouring in. The midnight are trying to grab me. The rock and roll are trying to stop them. Blah, blah, blah. Big schmas. They pull me out before he can fucking mutilate me. And there leaves Ronnie standing in the ring with his hands in the air and the Rock and Roll Express cheering for him and the people went, loved it and fucking went berserk and went home happy. That was a main event in the old days, folks. Now they would have said, oh, goddamn. <laughs> what the fuck? <clears throat> anyway. That was the series of matches that cradled Dennis leaving and Stan coming in was the Express versus Garvin and Wyndham. Yes, and and the and and Ronnie and Jimmy as a team at at in various points there. Yeah, over that period of time. But um, but yeah, but oh, but Dennis's interview that was so on TBS the following week. Since I was in Hawaii, they came out and said, of course, that I had been suspended. That's where D D Dusty had me do that, so that it could turn Jimmy Garvin babyface, set up us, us up with another team to wrestle. <clears throat> put some heat on us, keep the U S tag title. Cause the match was with Ronnie Garvin and Barry Windham. Keep the U S tag title program going, explain my absence for 12 whole days and, you know, and put some, you know, oomph on everything. And Dennis came out and did the promo and said that, that it was nothing that I did. It was a cosmic fireball that struck Ronnie Garvin, which was at least, at least they aired that when they, you know, that was, of course, I came back and followed up with, well, his face went up like the challenger. And that's as we've told the story when the <laughs> lights went dim and they called me back to the production to the uh, uh, director's booth where uh, Dusty could let me know to do that again and not mention the challenger. Do it again, kid. Don't mention the challenger. Our next question, Jim, was sent in to corny drive through at gmail.com from David Cuesta. My question is, how are the Undertaker's Buried Alive gimmick matches booked? Was there a trap door? Can you please explain how this was done? You know, I, I was involved in the planning of the first one. Uh, so I know when I'm going to answer your question. 
but it's another example, I think, of Stockholm Syndrome because I got a kick out of the first one because I was involved in the planning of the first one. And it's one of those Stockholm Syndrome things that you get in line where you're thinking with your captors and, you know, and it is is it in any way realistic? Actually, the way that it had been originally envisaged, I kind of thought it was, but it it just it became one of those things. It's just this is. And then, of course, when everything else went show busy over the next 20 years, now I'm thinking like, my God, what have we wrought? But. The original concept. And it has been it, it was altered because when you go back to the first buried alive match between Undertaker and Mankind and and we were trying to get something going on that would be a pay-per-view attraction. And those guys were two of the biggest stars we had. And I love I like both guys. I love Cactus. Obviously, everybody knows. And Undertaker it was such a unique gimmick. What if. These motherfuckers had this, and what a fight they're going to have, right? Because they that's why their matches were always so good, because their styles worked with each other, as well as their gimmicks, and they both pros. What if instead of deciding it in the ring, we actually have a fucking real graveyard? <laughs> and I see now, in hindsight, people are going, Cornette, Cornette, the guy that doesn't want any ha-ha in the business. But what if we had a real burial area, and a motherfucker had to go over there, and throw his opponent in and put him in the grave and cover him up. Right. And that's how that genocized. And, and I was on board with that between these two guys thinking, well, it's not something we could ever really do again, but this could be something that, you know, get some attention, pulling our pants down on Broadway on pay-per-view. Right. But if you go back and watch the first one, which I think was from October 96 ish or thereabouts, we found out something. It takes a long fucking time to cover somebody up in a fucking grave with dirt. It's not like it is in the movies. <laughs> Cause he, I know Bruce Pritchard will testify to this also. Cause I think he was at gorilla position. I'm watching the monitor and we're like, and, and right. And they're trying to cover him up and trying to cover it. Or who won that thing? Was it, it, it was, we covered taker up the first time. Didn't we? Or didn't know we covered up Mick. No, we covered up taker. Didn't we? I covered up my eyes. I don't remember. Well, who, because I think we had to, yes, I think we were burying Taker because we had to send at the last moment as an audible, we had to send other wrestlers out and it had to be heels. It wouldn't have made sense to be baby faces to to help cover Undertaker. Yes, it was Undertaker. (laughs) Because fucking Mick is, but now he's had this long match and he's blowed up, right? And he's fucking frantically trying to scrape and shovel all his dirt. That's a big fucking hole, right? It it takes, and Undertaker's seven feet tall, 300 pounds. How long does it take to cover him up? So we sent other people out with everything thing but fucking bailing shovels to fucking finally get that covered up and the and then they had come up with and i thought okay i'll go along with i didn't fight too much about this also but i think the lightning strike and taker's hand would come up through the fucking dirt right which i'm thinking well this is kind of cool actually it shows how you can be led down that path but uh (laughs) but they this when the special effects people got to it first of all they had like I said, it was a big hole. And then I think they did something else and changed it where he could, you know, and he could get out underneath. There was a thing, there was an apparatus where I like if the side of the grave that's underneath the dirt would open up so he could get out, but all the dirt would still fall in all day. It was a messy proposition regardless, but there was a way to get out from under it. Cause we didn't want to smother and kill him by for real. But But I, you know, I had a hand in that. I I apologize. Our next question, Jim, was sent in on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through from Norm Cardaro. I was interested in getting your take on why Billy Gunn was never a main eventer. He had the size, the look, and super over as a part of DX. I remember a short program with The Rock, and then he was reduced to mid-card shortly after. Well, you know... (laughs) He was a top guy. He wasn't there long enough to be a top guy in as a single and a tag team, in my opinion. The smoking guns were used as one of the tag teams. The smoking guns, the body donnas, and the Godwins, those poor guys, they had to go out and be in the middle every night, whether they were good or not, because it was just that was what Vince was doing with tag team wrestling at that time. And then with DX, 
suddenly they had a tag team. It was actually hot that they could do something with, but that was, it, it, he had just come from being rockabilly and, and road dog had just come from being road dog, Jesse James. The only guy on the roster they could beat was each other. And it just, because they actually really did kind of start hanging out in that, in that group, they got the opportunity, but then they ran with it. But when you think about it, he was, it, Billy was a smoking gun where it was limited at best rockabilly, which was the worst thing that ever fucking happened. Almost anybody, um, then DX, they were hot. And by what was it? 2000, 2001 DX was starting to cool off. And also that's when they started bringing in writers and I, I wasn't following everything closely cause I was down here in OVW. So I don't really know what Billy did after DX, but well, he did you Chuck know, and he, Billy, remember Chuck and Billy? Oh God. Well, there you go. Yeah. We may have just, I mean, I'm not trying to say that Billy would have been another stone cold Steve Austin. I don't think he'd say that. But he's a, a you know a good worker with great size and great shape and had some personality and could cut a fucking promo, but I don't know that you survive Rockabilly and Billy and Chuck all in the same lifetime and ever be viewed as a main event guy again. That'd be an interesting stat. What guy survived the most bad gimmicks and still had a really good career? I don't know, but there's one. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question, Jim, was sent in via email to corny drive at gmail.com from David. Is Jim aware of any time when tickling was used in a serious professional wrestling match and portrayed as a legitimate maneuver and not as a joke? If not, has it ever been used as a joke in a serious match to get a cheap pop? Well, well, all right, hold on. Um, I, I, let's start with the beginning. I don't think tickling has ever been used in a serious match as a serious maneuver. I guarantee you <laughs> tickling has been used as a rib on some guy on numerous occasions and whether the fans, the fans weren't probably designed to catch on to it, whether they did or not. And I'm sure that some outlaw mud show guy has done a spot of recent years revolving around tickling where the other guy was obviously cooperating with it to, you know, just hilarity and yucks all around, but I can't quote that chapter in verse. So I would, I would go with, it's probably happened most of the time as a rib on the other guy, like farting in their face or fucking, you know, shitting on you or something like that. All right. It would be an interesting gimmick if it's a really good, high quality wrestler, you know, someone with, you know, newspaper articles written about them. They come in and one of their moves is they get you down. They tickle you until you submit. But you can't get away from them. They have you down. And you can't get away. You never know. Yeah. You could have saved Ed Carboo Thomas's career if he had had that. <laughs> well, now there you go. Ed Carboo Thomas, the master of the tickle. I, I can see <laughs> that may have worked. Cause poor old Ed Carr. All right, our next question, Jim, was sent Maybe in. even Shawnee Bo Wynn. Shawnee Bo Wynn, it could have saved his career, too. Who's that? That's <laughs> well, that was, that was for about three people that still remember that era of Nashville wrestling, but Shawnee Bo Wynn, S-H-A-W-N-E-Y, middle name Bo, B-O, last name Wynn, <laughs> W-Y-N-N, was a college football player of some renown and I can't remember what college he went to, but Nick Goulas got a hold of him. So it was around Tennessee somewhere and broke him in, in like 77 or 78 ish briefly. And, and I saw television. I never saw him wrestle live. Cause we didn't get, uh, you know, I saw Nick's TV with him and I saw the newspaper clipping. So I assume he was rotten. Cause I saw him on some, a couple of brief short squash matches where he looked like a fucking college football player wrestling and he didn't last long, but he got a, a lot of newspaper publicity for Nick at the time. And also one hilarious Louisville local promo when Nick got TV on channel 11 for the only time ever in the history of Louisville summer of 78, trying to compete with Jarrett running the Commonwealth convention center instead of the Louisville gardens. And they ended up by the end of the summer, they were down to fan appreciation night, all tickets, $1, please come. But anyway, Nick, as, as you know, conducted all of his local promos, the inserts of two or three minutes, a couple of places in the program where you talked about the Louisville or local matches that were going to wherever. 
And Nick was not a natural television personality. He Nick was the coiner of the term. Instead of nine-man blindfold battle royal, the nine-bland manifold manifold match. <laughs> um, Nick, uh, you know, if, if, you know, if Nick had some he, like malaprops is what they used to call them. When like Norm Crosby or or who was the uh, famous sports figure that 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 uh, couldn't fucking say suey if the hogs had him. What was his name? God damn it, help me! Well, you, he's from well, New York. In New York, we had Ralph Kiner who would frequently no, make malaprops. There's another one, Harry Carey. No, more famous. Uh, the he's a coach or of of whatever the fuck. He always used to say shit. If the people don't want to come, we can't stop them. Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra. There you go. God coach. damn it. He's a manager and a well, manager baseball coach. player. Oh, oh, God damn it. You're just picking nits here right now. Just picking it and picking them and throwing them away. Anyway, where was I going with this? So fucking Nick is interviewing Shawnee Bo Wynn. And Nick tries to give what he thinks is the ultimate compliment. And remember, folks, this was 1978. And Nick had to be past 60 then. He wants to tell Shawnee Bowen that he's a great athlete, a great wrestler, and a real credit to his race, right? (laughs) But sometimes the words won't come to Nick. Now, I'm going to tell you what, Shawnee Bowen, I know that you you are a wrestler, and as a pussy, you are are certainly a a thing to your race. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) There you go. At any point when you were in Louisiana or even later on when you were in the WWF and they had the relationship with Memphis, did you ever run across or have anything to do with Marcus Dupree as we're talking about great football players from high school and college? Uh, No, actually, except to hear Watts and Dr. Death and some of the guys talk about him. Uh, And I was obviously not a big football fan at that point or still to this day, except for people I know who have played football because they were wrestlers. Um, but I think he worked with Mid South after we had been down there. I think did he or did he not? Or we, eh. I got to look into it. I saw something that he was in Memphis, and I have no memory of him there. So I got to ask around. But that would have been like in the mid nineties. But just because he was this major football player out of Mississippi, then he went to OU before he walked out of there to go, you know, back home, and then he had played for the, uh, New Orleans in the USFL. That's that's the Mid South territory. I just wondered if he was ever around considering all those factors. Yeah, no, and I I, I mean, obviously it, it wasn't because Watts and JR and Doc and all those guys wouldn't have been fans of his, so I don't know what went on there. All right, our next question, Jim. Was- possibly, possibly he was getting blackballed. He was getting blackballed like Big Ernie Holmes. <laughs> you, remember- <laughs> you remember that segment on Georgia TV? Yeah, he was there for a very short period of time. Yeah, because he, he came in. He, they, I don't know. I guess they were trying to, to train him or thought that obviously they would trade off the name or that maybe he was more serious about it or he thought he was more serious about it than he ended up when he tasted it for a week or two or whatever. But I remember that famous segment right before the Ole Anderson turn uh, 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 promo where he had turned on Dusty in a cage and that famous promo, you know, he's coming out interrupting. Ernie Ernie Holmes, Holmes, yeah. Because Ernie Holmes, the part of the promo that nobody plays is Ernie's there with Gordon Soley, and he's going, well, I I just don't know what's going on. Uh, I'm trying to get a match here, but uh, people be blocking me. And uh, they just, uh, (laughs) I just, you know, I'd like to wrestle here for these people, but uh, I keep getting blocked. And Gordon's trying to, there's obviously some story that we're not hearing, and Gordon's trying to prod him. Like, well, who do you think could be doing? I don't know. But I just keep getting blocked. And finally, <laughs> finally, Oli, Oli comes out and says, well, nobody wants to see you because you're the shit. Basically, he says almost the shits. I can't remember. They don't care about you anyway. Why don't you just go on? Get Just get on out of here. He just he just punks Ernie Holmes out and walks him off the stage. That's the great one, too. As he's leaving, he's like, you're going to get yours, Oli. And Oli goes, not from you. Yeah, yeah, but not from <laughs> Yeah, you're going to get yours, Ole, but not from you. I'm not. <laughs> and he was foreseeing the future because he was the booker also. But I think, didn't he have like one match in the Omni, Ernie Holmes? And he just, and then I, and they had Otis Sistrunk in there a couple years before that, didn't they? Or afterwards. I could be wrong, but I think also Ernie Holmes was the guy who wrestled for Watts at least once in Jackson, Mississippi, because uh, Jeff Steele told the story on my show on 605 that. 
he was wrestling against Ernie Ladd in Jackson, and he took off his jersey, and he got so excited and pumped up, he threw it into the crowd, and the next day there was an ad in the paper from his agent, can you please return the jersey if you have it? It's a Super Bowl jersey. <laughs> he got all pumped up and just threw it into the crowd. <laughs> And then, yes, oh, Otis Sistrug, yes. And then and then there was, for you real deep-cut football fans, there was Ron Mikulogic in Memphis. That's right. M- Ron Mikulogic, he was famous for being another one of Lawler's uh, fodder for one of his most uh, memorable angles, but he had played, wasn't it? There was a USFL Memphis team. The showboats. Showboats. There you go. And Ron Mikulogic. And so, but we're seeing this on TV in Louisville. And at the time, as a, you know, not being a football fan, I'm 14 years old. I have, and it's the USFL. I don't know who the fuck Ron Mikulogic is, right? But he was a big deal in Memphis, as as Lawler said one time about Plowboy Frazier. Anyway, um, so Ron Mikulogic is a typical co- football fucking jock coming out trying to do a wrestling promo and he's talking about, he wants to wrestle and, and, and he's, uh, you know, he's, uh, trying to get somebody to, to let him break in. Right. And maybe take him under their wing or whatever. Lawler comes out. He just eats him up one week, just spits him out verbally and just fucking tells him, get out of there. And then the next week, because he said, you got to have a license to be a wrestler. You ain't got no less. So the next week, Ron McLeodgett comes back with this piece of paper. I got a license. Lawler comes out and says, all you got there is an application. The athletic commissioner <laughs> hadn't signed it. Well, you got to send that in. Blah, blah. It just makes an idiot out of him again, his big, dumb football player, right? And then as McLeodgett is walking off, because he uh, he had already told Lance Russell that the uh, reason he had to retire was because, you know, he, his knees got hurt. And uh, so he had to retire from football. And Lawler says, I, I heard you say you had to retire from football because your knees got hurt. You got bad knees. Well, your knees can get hurt in wrestling too, son. And he just kind of punks him out verbally again. I don't think they had any hope for Ron Mikulogic as a baby face. I think they were building a couple weeks for Lawler to get over some fucking slub here. But anyway, Mikulogic starts walking off and Lawler takes a fucking metal folding chair and grabs it and folds it up and runs after him. And the only problem was they didn't smarten the, the, the television people up in those days. So they go from the, the shot on the set. They had another camera over by the ring, but they weren't ready. So Lawler runs off out of camera range and you hear this whack and, uh, <laughs> and the people pop and scream. He is just fucking whacked that fucking Michelogic in the knee with that chair and you didn't see it, but you, it was even better because it was in your mind, a sickening thud and the people gasp and all this shit. And there he is rolling around and, and Lawler screaming, your knees can get hurt in wrestling too, son. And they're dragging him out of there. And they got a couple of weeks out of that. Ron Michel- th- this was actually a match in Louisville. Jerry Lawler, Plowboy Frazier, and Big Ernie Ladd against Tommy Rich Ron Mikulogic and Andre the Giant. Wow. Mikulogic was in a business like fucking 12 weeks that time period. He gets to team up with Andre the Giant. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where at one point fucking uh, uh, Ernie Ladd and Frazier were standing side by side and they were both the same height. So it killed Frazier's gimmick. Andre was still a couple inches taller than both of them, but, but killed Frazier's gimmick being too close to Ernie because they were both 6'9". Hey, it's kind of amazing how long Walter Johnson hung on. Like, he wasn't like a flash in a pan. He actually wrestled for a long time. Yeah, but a lot of that time was in in Michigan and Ohio for the Sheik when the Sheik was not doing that well. Yeah. So I don't know that he made a lot of money at it. He may have done it for a while, but he was not a huge star most places. All right, Jim, our next question was sent in via email to corny drive through at gmail.com from Steve Lucas in Taylor Mill, Kentucky. I'm a big fan and cult follower. The Briscoe Brothers promos from around 2010 to 2012 were the things legends are made of. For example, quote, Terry Funk ain't wear no mouthpiece. Did you do any writing for them or was it all their stuff? Also, do you think they will ever get to go to WWE or is it too late? Um, second question first, you never say never. Um, I, it may be too late for them in their life that they would want to, because, um, they got really good deals from what I understand with ring of honor to also, they, they like living at home. They like being around the family They're uh, in 
the suburbs of Maryland as <laughs> they live way out. Um, and I don't, I don't know if it's on their radar now to do that. They have all got kids and everything. At one time they were going, um, and that was one of those things, but, um, and no, it, to answer the main question, I was helping produce some of their promos and I was helping book when they, when they were involved, but nobody ever wrote for the Briscoes, um, because that's why I thought they were the greatest gimmick in the business in that little time period there, because they were completely legitimate. Um, we would sometimes t tell, give them ideas on what to say. And I love the thing where Mark would just chime in like the, you know, little sir echo every once in a while, or just say something off the wall that would pop you in one word or reinforce Jay's point. And Jay was the fucking, you know, the, the, the front man of the promos. And he it was incredible. But it was all their shit. The, it was it was our topics and our angles, but the way they would say it. And once that, and, and me and Delirious both, once that we would hear them do something one time, then sometimes if we were doing a lot of promos in a row, I would go back and say, hey, do that thing you do where, you know, blah, blah, blah. But we didn't make up a lot of shit for them. We just gave them stuff to talk about in their own way. And, and, and then sometimes they'd just shoot something at the farm and bring it in and show it. And I'd say, fuck that. Put it on the air right now. That's fucking perfect. I just, I love their shit. <laughs> All right. Our next question, Jim, was sent in from Jeremy in Lexington, Tennessee to corny drive through at gmail.com. I met Jim and the Midnights in Nashville and want to say thank you for the fun merchandise and Q&A. My question is, back in the kayfabe days, were doctors ever in on it? For example, when Lawler broke his leg in 1980 or something similar, would his doctor have known it was a work or would what? he have given him a different timetable for a return based on him thinking it was oh, a shoot? Oh, oh I, see, I see what you, I thought you meant the doctor would know it was a worked broken leg, but no, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, no, I, I mean, it, it, that's something that you wouldn't even have had to have got into because any doctor sees what professional wrestlers do go, whether it's a shoot or not, you, you know, you have to wait a certain period of time before an injury like that is healed to even, you know, begin to, I'm sure he gave Lawler a schedule. Well, you can start working out again. So, <laughs> um, working out again at some point, like that was going to happen, but, uh, but no, actually, and Lawler kept disregarding doctor's orders anyway, and doing goofy shit because the houses were down on several different periods that year. And so he came back, to be at ringside handcuffed to Jimmy Hart, or he came back, he had the, the cast match with killer Carl Krupp, which was Jimmy Hart's top heel at the time. And Lawler came back with, with a full plaster cast from hip to ankle thinking that that would protect his leg. And so the deal was they made, since everybody knew his leg was really broken, they made killer Carl Krupp wear the same thing a full leg plaster cast. And they had this match, try to get the fucking house up, which it did. But Lawler still, he was leg dropping with the goddamn cast with the broken leg. And so it, it set his recovery back. He originally wasn't supposed to be out for 11 months, but it worked out that way by the time it was all said and done. But then look at that. He had the best 15 years of his life in the ring, probably after that and still took huge bumps. And, you know, he was just, he, when you think about it, Lawler's a fucking genetic freak, never been in a goddamn gym a day in his life and still actually moves in a wrestling ring better than most people just in terms of moving around. And he's almost 70. If he hadn't hurt his leg, do you think you would have had cast matches every week until he was totally healed? <laughs> uh, well, they did him around the goddamn they did him around the territory once they did him in Lew Memphis, Louisville and Evansville. I can't remember if he did it in Lexington or not. Our final question here this week, Jim was sent in via email, the corny drive through at gmail.com from Joey Hughes. I'm reading the archives of the wrestling observer and I'm working my way through 1991. I guess my question is how in the fuck does independent wrestling work? Every issue has Jim and Stan Lane appearing with a couple other big names somewhere in front of 875 people paying $5 <laughs> each. How does anyone get paid? I've listened to Jim break down some years deep dive style on the podcast. I think 1991 would be really interesting. 
That's an interesting idea. Um, well, 1991 wasn't very deep for me. I didn't work that much. Um, well, compared to what I do now, I guess I did. In 1991, I was spending most of the year setting up Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Um, so I was still doing the commentary, which was a nice check once a month for the LPWA through Joe Petticino and, and Tor Berg. And the independent shows that Stan and I worked on, and we were both living in Charlotte and had just left WCW. Uh, Bobby Fulton ran a number of those spot shows and we would work with Bobby and Jackie and we'd get, you know, at the time, three or four, $500 a piece, you know, an hour, hour and a half from Charlotte and not doing anything. I was not, uh, truthfully quite as comfortable then as I am now. Uh, and I think Greg Price ran a few spot shows and then every once in a while, uh, like a Joel Goodhart thing would come up where it was a big deal in Philly. And, and, you know, it, it, back in those days, top indie payoffs were a grand or 1500. Um, and there, so it was a couple of those over that year, but I didn't do that much really. So the ones that he's talking about, the was VWA, me at, uh, the VWA, David Richmond, Lehigh. Virginia. Yeah. David Lehigh. Uh, I think that was, you know, 500 bucks, 27 years ago. What's that worth now? You know, but, uh, um, it was just on weekends occasionally because we were living there in Charlotte and not doing anything else. And, and Stan was not, he didn't get it, try to get himself booked really anywhere else. He had been tired of being on the road for a while. It was just taking the year off. And, and I had obviously told him I was starting Smoky Mountain Wrestling by that point. So he knew that sometime in the early part of 1992 that he was going to have some type of job as a, uh, you know, as a member of the heavenly bodies and, and, he ran with that for a year, but and that he didn't work outside Smoky Mountain Wrestling then. He just made the dates that uh, if it was two days a week or three days a week or whatever and didn't try to get booked anywhere else or really do anything. I think he did a tour of Japan just because he wanted to go back one more time. And then by 93, he decided he didn't have the passion anymore. So he retired in the ring. And then shortly after that is when Jerry Jarrett, I think, called him up uh, to come – be an announcer in the WWF, which he's always liked and had that announcer voice. So he tried that for a while and learned some about television. But then when Jared had left, obviously Stan was like all the rest of us. He, he, he didn't want to live in Connecticut any longer and he could absolutely fucking have to. He wanted to get back to North Carolina on the first thing smoking as Dennis Condry would have said. So that happened. And, you know, uh, and then he had a whole another 20 year career as, uh, as doing the boat racing and commentary and production with stuff he learned from wrestling. So that was just, uh, it was just mine and stands keeping busy that year around the Smoky mountain project. All right. One final question here this week, Jim, this one was sent in to corny drive through at gmail.com from Ben rich. I attended. A ben, I have been too. We got that in common. <laughs> I, <laughs> I attended a TV taping. Uh, then he says NWA Worldwide with a question mark. When I was around 10 or 11 at the Commonwealth Convention Center, I seem to remember an angle between the Horsemen and Sting that led up to the first clash, so I'm guessing it was early 88. I'm pretty sure you and the Midnight worked too. Any memories of working in Louisville under Crockett? Well, yes, because there were a couple of shows. There was a house show and there was a TV taping, and it was the spring and summer of 88. Um, and I can't remember which one was which, uh, but I know that one night uh, it was uh, Stan and, and Bobby in singles matches against Bobby Fulton and Tommy Rogers, the Fantastics. Maybe in the TV taping, maybe in the house show, whatever, but that's where we've told a story before with, where Bobby Fulton wanted to show that the Fantastics had come to kick some ass, and he's like, ah, oh, this is Louisville, it's old-time wrestling town, so <laughs> we're standing in the ring, and here come the Fantastics, and Bobby Fulton has grabbed this big shovel from the back door of the arena and brought it like he's coming to the ring like he's going to clean up on us right but tommy had said bobby don't do that you don't do that cornet's going to say something right and as soon as i saw him coming i grabbed the microphone and i said what's the matter fulton your partner's not housebroken <laughs> and just all of you like, <laughs> but um crockett couldn't get into the louisville gardens because jared had it obviously booked 52 weeks a year and uh, at that time they were not going to book freedom hall at the fairgrounds. Cause that's 
16,000 plus seats for basketball and they weren't going to fucking fill that up. So basically they had to go downtown to the Commonwealth convention center and wrestling has seldom drawn there. That's where Nick Goulas died in 1978. Uh, that's where, uh, Vince McMahon, the early, you know, Hogan, I think his first appearance in Louisville in 84, I think did some business, but that's the same place WWF had to go to. Uh, which is why they never did huge or repeat big business house show wise in Louisville. People didn't like going to that building. They had to pay more to park. It was just, it was, it was different. Uh, Louisville had been a creature of habit with the Louisville gardens since, you know, before a lot of those people were born. So anyway, um, so, but yeah, Crockett went there, I think twice and, uh, and it, it was fun coming back to Louisville, but you know, it, that's the only time I've ever appeared on wrestling event in that building. Cause that, you know, that was not the preferred place to go to, to run an event, but that that's also, I did say on worldwide wrestling to promote it. I said, okay, you know, coming up, we're going to be in Louisville, Kentucky too. Tony, David, that's my hometown. As a matter of fact, the mayor is throwing me a, a big celebratory luncheon cause I'm coming back to town and, and they asked me, they said, would you like us to invite Muhammad Ali to the luncheon? I said, no, nah, we've already got broccoli. We don't need another vegetable. <laughs> and all the people were, oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> well, I'm trying to do what I can, right? And uh, But anyway, it was fun. You have a challenger for every year. You have another challenger promo. Yeah. For that year. <laughs> what do you think of them renaming the airport uh, after Ali? Uh, I think they should because everybody would know where the fuck it was because right now the name of the airport in Louisville, well, they call it Louisville International Airport now, but the official name and the code name or whatever is Standiford Field, named after fucking, I think, Mayor Standiford or Governor Standiford from like fucking 80 years ago, and nobody knows where the fuck Standiford Field is. So at least if you said Muhammad Ali International Airport, they'd know you were talking about Louisville. All right, and with that, the drive through has closed. Oh, you need to come up with something new there, too. Boy, I'm talking I'm talking about put some fucking powder, pussy powder on your fucking act there and freshen it up. Well, remember, if you get pussy powder on your act and you need to sue, call <laughs> Stephen you, P. New. Yeah, you need to freshen that shit up. <laughs> Stephen, will, Stephen will get your crack and snackable condition in no time. <laughs> <laughs> all right then yes ladies and gentlemen uh, uh you can follow jim on twitter at the jim Cornette. you can follow me on twitter at great brian last you can hear me on the 605 super podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast of course Cornette's collectibles at jimcornet.com for t-shirts burger towels restraining orders action figures in limited amounts now so move quickly books autograph photos with money going to cancer so many things. <laughs> Show on right now. JimCornette.com. It's not going to cancer. We're not supporting <laughs> cancer. It's the American <laughs> you motherfucker. It's the American Cancer Society the money is going to to fight cancer, not to support. We're not contributing money to the disease to strengthen itself against the advancements of modern technology and science and medicine. So let's just get that straight because people, some people around the country and the world may think that I would give money to a certain disease. That's right. Say no to only, the pro cancer brigade. O- only if I can uh, pick who it affects. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, well, I contribute to any diseases. That's at jimcornet.com. Cornet yeah, sure it is. Uh, you can hear the Jim Cornette experience when it debuts every Thursday. And of course, the YouTube channel, tinyurl.com slash official corny YouTube, or just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette, and it should pop right up with the exclusive Travis Heckle artwork. And we forgot we forgot to mention the tiny URL for uh, uh, Have a Beef with Jim Cornette in Chicago. It, it's tinyurl.com slash corny in Chicago. That's right. Get beefy with corny in Chicago. tinyurl.com slash corny in Chicago. But until Thursday on the experience for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho! Thank God that's over.